Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to our online life group uh, for senior adults. It's good to be back with you. Um, we're going to be starting a study uh, this quarter uh, on the two books, uh, the book of Job and the book of Ecclesi Ecclesiastes. A um, little trivia to start with, Bible trivia. Why do we pronounce the word Job as, or it's just spelled J-O-B, which we say in English is Job, and I say my name is Bob. Uh, but here in the Bible, we pronounce it as Job. Well, uh, if you go back uh, to how the name of Job was uh, pronounced in Hebrew, it was Iova, uh, and actually it means hatred. I don't know why, but it means hatred. Um, but Iova was how the Hebrews pronounced the word. Then the translation went from Hebrew to Greek to Aramaic to German to English uh, and changed many different times, but the letter O always remained the same because of the word Elohim, or God, Holy God. Uh, so hence we get J-O or Job, and it's uh, we pronounce like it's a it in, in it's not like job like we pronounce it in a a verb or a noun. So that's why the emphasis is always on the letter O. So we get Job. Uh, the name of the person uh, Job, uh, Job, is only found uh, once in the Bible. Uh, this man is only found once in the Bible, Job, um, and no one else is named Job in the Bible. So the other thing, interestingly enough, in chrono chronological order, if you read the Bible, uh, a chronologic Bible, which uh, I'll show you, which I am reading, is backward to you probably, uh, but the chronologic Bible that I'm reading every day uh, it shows that the book of Job is the second book in the Bible. I was reading and finishing Genesis. I turned the page and there was Job. And I thought I had missed a whole bunch of stuff in the Bible, but I didn't. Actually, some writers feel that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, the exact dates uh, that it was written, is, uh, they're not known. Uh, but many biblical historians feel uh, that this book was written uh, in the years of 2000 to 1800 BC, uh, and not much of Israel's history is contained in the book. Now, we do know that Job lived after the time of the patriarchs and before the Exodus, and he lived after the flood. Uh, God said there was no one on earth at that time as righteous as Job. So that eliminates Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are all dead by this time. And Moses was not born yet because he doesn't come on the scene until uh, the first couple chapters of Exodus. So the, these events that we're going to be t talking about could have taken place during the 400-year uh, Egyptian captivity. Uh, remember, Moses uh, you know, led the people out of, Israel, out of Egypt at, at age 80. Uh, so there are 320 years of the captivity that really haven't been accounted for in Scripture. So many people think that the, the book of Job or the life of Job was around that time. Uh, some people I've even read think that the uh, book of Job or the events of Job uh, should be placed between chapter 11 and 12 of the book of Genesis. But uh, that's not the way it is in the in the canon. Now, Job, uh, the person, is not the writer of this book. Uh, it was probably written by one of his counselors. It could have been, even been Elihu, who we'll see later in the book of Job. Uh, and the style and the text of this book uh, suggests that a non-Israelite did write it. Uh, it uses the word God more than it does Yahweh or Lord or Elohim. Uh, the style suggests that these were very wise men who wrote the book. Uh, they were skillful poets, uh, theologians. Uh, and because the heavenly events took place, we know it was truly inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, this book was written in times of uh, great wealth and uh, prosperity. And Job was considered to be the most wealthy and, and most upright man of the time. Uh, he loved God and was very obedient to God's commands. 
uh, it was written, uh, we, we know it was written in the land of Uz, which was near Palestine and, and the Euphrates River. Uh, it was territory, around the territory that Abraham and Lot had established when God sent them out on his journey. Uh, and, and Job, the book of Job and, and Ecclesiastes are part of the wisdom books. Now, what is wisdom? Uh, of course, Proverbs defines wisdom as the fear of the Lord, as the beginning of wisdom. And Moses defined wisdom as uh, being derived from a personal relationship with God and, obe and from obedience to God's commands. We, we find that in Deuteronomy 4, verses 4 through 8. Now, Moses also promised wisdom would be so powerful that nations would admire all who possessed it. And wisdom, if we define it today, would be learning how to live a useful and, and meaningful life by following God's leadership. In other words, living life through practical experience by obeying God. Now, the themes and the message of, of the book uh, it was written to show the theodicy of God, the sovereignty of God. You know, God's sovereignty shown in the light of human suffering in this book, in this case. And, and some have challenged this because of the innocence of Job. I mean, what did poor Job do? Uh, nothing. But God was going to use Job as his example uh, to show his sovereignty in, in suffering. And, and if God would have spelled out what would have happened, uh, Job's faith might not have been as strong. And, and Job accepted life as it came along without answers. Uh, all he needed was faith. Uh, you know, how many times have we demanded answers from God and when all he really wants is our faith and our trust? Uh, God has everything under control and we should know that and we should, we should obey God no matter what. And it clearly shows that God was sovereign and in control of everything uh, throughout the book. I mean, he's in total control of the outcome. Uh, he protects Job, uh, even though he is made to suffer. Uh, he rewards Job uh, for all of his sufferings and, and his faithfulness. Uh, and, and Job, he had no clue uh, why God was putting him through this torment. But still, he remained obedient and he trusted God. So we could ask the question, why would God allow Satan to have an influence over him by using Job to suffer? Well, God used Satan to prove the righteousness of his people. He, you know, even though God allows his people to suffer, he will take care of us. He will protect us. You know, and, and when Job's friends and his wife gave up hope, uh, he remained steadfast in his faithfulness to God. You know, righteousness has a supreme value that God treasures above all. And God will always protect the righteous, even through suffering. Remember that when you're going through some difficult times. God will always protect the righteous. So this is a great book of uh, perseverance under trial. Uh, it's not the easiest book to read or to study or understand. And it's not the easiest book to teach, uh, but it does show that a life built on God can and will endure anything. And some writers say it might be the most beautifully written book in the Bible. And uh, as we get into it, you'll see uh, some of the way that the, the words are written very beautifully in, in, in a poetic manner. So let's, let's kind of get into the first chapter. Uh, verses 1 through 5, which are not in our focal verses, but we'll get there in a minute. Uh, who was Job? Well, it says he was morally and spiritually upright. Uh, he was mature and honest. Uh, he hated evil and he, and he loved purity. Uh, he feared God and he trusted God above all. And James said he was a man of endurance and patience. Uh, we know that he was the wealthiest man of all in the area. And back then, wealth was not measured in how much money you had or how much land you had or how big a house you had. It was measured in terms of livestock. And it said that uh, Job had 7,000 sheep uh, to provide wool and meat. He had 3,000 camels and 500 donkeys uh, for his transportation fleet. He had uh, 500 teams of oxen as the John Deere of the day. 
and he had the most servants to farm and to wait on him. So he was the most well-respected man by the surrounding tribes and the people in that area. He also had a wonderful family. Uh, he had seven sons and three unmarried daughters, uh, all by the same wife. Uh, and the number seven, three, and ten in the Bible uh, mean completeness. Uh, they, were, they were all grown. Uh, the men had families. And they were a very close-knit family. Uh, and Job had it all. Job had a wonderful life, a very prosperous and wonderful life, blessed on all sides. And Job prayed for his children every day. I mean, remember, uh, he, he offered sacrifices. He purified his sons so that they would be acceptable to God. And, and also remember that there was no written law or priests at that time. So he was the religious leader of the household, and he took his responsibility very seriously and carried it out daily. And the sacrifices that he made were to ask forgiveness for his sins and, and those of his family. Job never considered himself to be sinless. Even though he was a righteous man, he trusted and believed in God, he still believed that he was not sinless. So the question is, do we pray for our children every day? and our grandchildren every day, um, uh, they sure need it in this day and age, in this sinful world. Uh, you know, are we teaching them the word and, and helping them live it? And are we living upright and, and righteous lives as an example to them? Uh, they look up to us for direction in, in, in scripture and obeying God. And are we doing that the way that, that Job would do, in a very, very serious way. Now, in verses 6 and 7, uh, God called his angels to heaven uh, for a planning session. And uh, there are other references in the Bible where God pulled his angels together in 1 Kings. And, and actually, if we go to chapter 2, verse 1, he pulls his, his angels together again uh, to inflict some bodily harm on Job. Um, but God called them together this time. Uh, to, he wanted them to give an account of their activities on earth. And uh, both his faithful angels and his fallen angels were called. And from Genesis, you know, we've seen examples uh, of good and, and bad angels. I mean, certainly uh, Satan, he appeared very early in the creation story in chapter 3, which we heard Jason preach about last week, and I'm sure we'll continue on this week. Um, there were angels that appeared to Abraham uh, to announce the birth of Isaac. And also there were angels that appeared to Lot to tell him that you, you better get out of Dodge in, in the Sodom and Gomorrah because it was going to be destroyed. And then there was Melchizedek. Uh, we, we know about Melchizedek, the king of Salem, but we don't know very much about him. We don't know whether he was an angel or whether he was a Christophany. Was he Christ? coming to earth and to, to meet with him. So we do have a history of angels uh, on the earth. Uh, but this calling them together shows that God does have authority over all the angels. Now, Satan was among the angels who came. I mean, he didn't come to submit to God. He, he came to be an adversary for, to God. Uh, you know, Satan was a corrupt angel uh, because of his own pride. Uh, Satan felt that he should be God and be as powerful as him. Um, you know, did, didn't he even ask Eve in the garden if she wanted to be like God? Uh, you know, he wanted to definitely be like God. Uh, and But, you know, he's accountable to God, uh, but he's not going to obey God. You know, one day Satan is going to stand before God uh, for his sins. And one day we all know the end of the story. He's going to be punished for eternity and God's going to give him a hot bath in the lake of fire. So Satan is, is quite different than God. I mean, he can only be in one place at a time, uh, not like the spirit of God that roams freely uh, all over all the world. Uh, he cannot see into our minds or see the future, but he can sure get into our head with his evil thoughts. He can do nothing without the permission of God. And, and we can actually overcome him. God's people can overcome him using the power of God. 
We, we can uh, banish Satan. And God does put a limitation on him on what he can and what he cannot do. So God asks him, point blank, uh, where, where he came from. And Satan said he was roaming the earth looking for anyone he could corrupt. Wow, does that sound familiar? I mean, he's got a, a big audience down here because there's a lot of corruption going on on this earth. Now we get into our focal lessons for the week, and, and we start with verse 8. Uh, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one on earth is or no one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. So God asked Satan, Hey, uh, have you checked out my uh, my servant Job? I mean, he's the best I had to offer on earth. Uh, there's no one like him on earth. I mean, he is the most blameless man. Uh, he has the most integrity. He fears God. Uh, at every every step, he avoids evil. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, actually, some scholars don't believe in the Bible that this really happened. Uh, they say that the writer made this up as part of the story. Uh, I don't buy into that. I mean, because the Holy Spirit would never allow fiction in, in the word. I mean, and if this is fiction, the whole account of Job is meaningless. It, be, it misses the point of Job's faithfulness to God. So when I read that, I said, that, that doesn't make sense at all. I mean, these are supposed to be biblical scholars writing this. Anyway, verses 9 through 11. Uh, Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land, but stretch out your hands and strike everything he owns and he will surely curse you to your face. So now Satan is attacking Job's motives. I mean, his whole life, uh, said Job's whole life has been blessed by God. Uh, he, and he's only upright because you've blessed him greatly with material things. Uh, this is implying that Job was only serving God for what he could get out of it. And he was in it for his own glory, not God's glory. Uh, and Satan says he just wants to build his, wanted to build his own wealth and fame. And you know, doesn't that sound exactly as the world would respond to something like this? So Satan says, let's see what would happen if you took it all away. Uh, you've always protected him from harm. Uh, will he obey you or will he curse you? Now in verse 12, uh, very well, the Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And you know where he was going, right down to earth to attack. So God gave Satan permission to take his possessions away. But he said, you cannot kill Job. You can't touch him. And Job now is going to be put to the ultimate test. And God is going to allow suffering and persecution and difficulty for his purpose. Uh, but God knew Job would withstand all the worst that Satan could give. He knew that Job loved him. He loved God. And he was totally devoted to him. So, you know, how many times have we been attacked by Satan? You know, we may have been attacked by Satan even today and not even realized it. I mean, we come upon hardship and if we ever doubt God, boy, that's an attack. Uh, we lose something valuable. You know, do we trust God to replace it? If not, that's an attack. You know, we may not always understand how God is working, but we must trust him. And God knew and allowed every attack uh, by Satan to take place. You know, God knows all about our troubles. Uh, he's never surprised by anything that is happening. But God is also very compassionate when we have difficulties. So let the attacks begin. In verses 13 through 19, uh, we're going to see some tragedy that's going to struck Job and his family. Uh, there were messengers that were sent back from each of these tragedies. And in fact, there were four disasters that would happen in a matter of minutes. Now, disaster number one, the first messenger came to Job and said, while your children were at your oldest son's house feasting, the Sabaeans came and carried off all your donkeys and cattle and killed your servants. Now, Job's family was very close knit. 
uh, the siblings uh, gathered for festivals and parties, and it said there was uh, much eating and drinking of wine, and they may not have been following uh, God as closely as Job was. Because Job and his wife really didn't attend these parties because they felt that the sons may become drunk and curse God. Now, these attackers, the Sabaeans, were nomadic Arabians from the southwest. Uh, they were not friends at all of the people of Israel. Uh, but usually they were only raiders of farms and animals. And But this time they killed all of his servants. So this was something new. Now, disaster number two, uh, another messenger came and, and told Job, uh, the fire of God, or lightning, has fallen from the sky and struck your servants and sheep. And they're all dead. They're all gone. Another big disaster. Disaster number three, another servant. While this servant was still there, another servant came. You know, and if that's not bad enough, it said the Chaldeans have stolen all your camels, your oxen, your donkeys, and killed your servants. Now, the Chaldeans uh, were raiding a nomad groups that came from an area to the north. So Job was being, his, his uh, worth was being attacked from the north and the south. And uh, usually these men only took crops and animals, but again, they killed all the servants. Now, what does this mean? Most of Job's wealth has now been taken away. I mean, it's like, how would you feel when the stock market would crash and, and most of your 401k takes a hit? You virtually have nothing left. I mean, I think we would be in a panic and we would be distraught uh, as, as Job probably was getting there. But disaster number four, the final blow, uh, no pun intended, is that a tornado came and destroyed your son's house and killed all your children. I mean, remember on Hee Haw when, when Buck Owens used to sing, if it weren't for bad luck, he had no luck at all? Well, that's kind of where Job is right now. All of his 10 children and his lineage gone instantly. Yeah, notice that each time God spared one servant. Uh, from each tragedy to bring back the bad news. So within a minute, Job lost his empire, his heirs. He was no longer rich and powerful. Uh, he no longer had lineage to succeed him. And if you look at the tragedies, two of these tragedies came from man, and two of these tragedies came from natural disasters that God had allowed. Now in verse 20 and 21, Job stood up tore his robe and shaved his head. He fell to the ground and worshiped, saying, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we've heard that saying before. And here it is. Job is, is in mourning saying this. Uh, this must have been devastating to Job. Uh, he tore his clothes. He shaved his head. He started the mourning process. He probably threw ashes all over him. But he did not curse God. He fell to the ground and he worshiped God. You know, Job had always learned to find strength in God. Now, in his greatest sorrow, I mean, he is really hurting. He turns to God. He says he came into the world with nothing and he was going to go out the same way. God gave it. So he has every right to take it away. So Job didn't complain, but he blessed the name of the Lord. He knew God had a plan and a purpose for giving him his wealth. Uh, he knew in his sovereignty, God could take it all away. And Job knew he was unworthy to curse God for what he had allowed to happen. I mean, he said, we all come into this world with nothing and everything we have, we get from God. And we can't take it with us. You know, it's an old saying, you never saw a U-Haul up behind a hearse. Um, it reminded me of, of when my mother passed away a number of years ago. My mother, a wonderful woman, she always used to carry in her change purse a, a, an extra quarter because she said that if I ever got lost or in trouble or uh, I needed to call somebody on a pay phone, remember those, a phone booth? She said, I always had a quarter to call somebody and get help. Well, when she was uh, laying in, in state and, and before they closed the coffin, they allowed the family to go up and view the coffin. 
and I had a quarter in my pocket and I, I stuck it into the into the casket before it was closed and I said to her mom if you ever need me just call me and she took it with her so uh, I hope she took some of me with her also and, and blessing me okay you know God God does not measure us by our possessions at all we must accept without question what God does for us and what God does to us the good stuff and the bad stuff we must accept it without question. Verse 22, throughout all of this, Job did not sin or blame God for anything. Well, Job knew he had not sinned against God, but he still accepted what God was allowing to happen. You know, how many people have we known that have had some difficulties, some health problems, other problems, financial problems, marital problems, and they turned their backs on God. They refused to turn to God for help. See, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Instead, he praised the name of the Lord. He trusted God in everything, and he remained faithful. See, the lesson here also is that Satan is very powerful. He will rob and steal everything we have if we let him. So we must always be aware of where he is working and, and how he is working and what he is trying to do to destroy us. And temptation is always around us and waiting for us to sin and sin against God. But here's the lesson to take back with you. We must all be like Job. Trust in everything, good or bad. Know God is in control of your life and let him have it. Let God have your life. And suffering is only temporary and used by God to make us strong. You know, God may heal us or he may take us. And both are the best outcomes against suffering. So that's our lesson for today. Um, got some information for you. Uh, next, The next two weeks, uh, I will be away on um, vacation with the family and will not be recording. Steve Withrow is going to be teaching in my place and for those of you who can and will, uh, I would encourage you to come to Sunday school and hear Steve teach, a, a gifted teacher. Uh, he's been a pastor. He's got a lot of credentials, and he is a, a gifted teacher, if you know Steve and Lana. Come and support them if you can. Uh, also, we all know that Howard is in the hospital. Uh, he suffered a stroke. He did not fall in the shower, uh, but uh, he, he only suffered the stroke. And he's making progress. I haven't heard from Sylvia today, but I'm sure you'll be receiving updates through email and Facebook and such. So uh, please be aware of that. So uh, let's pray and close out. Um, good being with you again. I'll be back the fourth Sunday of the month to uh, close out the book of, well, I won't close out the book of Job, but to give another lesson in Job. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We praise you. You praise your name. We praise you for everything that you've given us throughout uh, our lives. Lord, we know that everything comes from you. It, it, without you, we would have nothing. And Lord, we just thank you that you've given us the most important gift of life, and that is Jesus as our Savior. And through his, his death and shed blood, we have forgiveness of sin. That's a great gift. Through his resurrection, we have eternal life, and that's the best gift that we will spend eternity with you. So, Father, bless us and, and just let us uh, dwell on that, that we will spend eternity with you as uh, children of God. Father, we do thank you again for this lesson. We thank you for everything you've provided for us. And uh, we just ask uh, that you uh, give us a great day this evening. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all and uh, hope you have a blessed day and uh, a blessed week. And for those of you who um, may be watching this and will be in Sunday school tomorrow, uh, you're going to get the same version. Bye.